Okay, everyone, thanks again for uh, joining us today. Uh, this is uh, Matt Schultz. You might be surprised I'm not Dr. Rebecca Munich, but she'll be joining us soon. Um, and this is our fifth Sustainable Phosphorus webinar. Uh, and the topic of today's webinar is regulation of biosolids and manure land application. Um, Becca, if you would, could you just confirm that you're hearing my audio okay? Yes. Great. We can hear you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I appreciate your joining us. Um, a couple uh, things about the webinar. Um, we've asked that everyone stay muted and keep their video off. Um, there just gets to be too much uh, drainage on the bandwidth with the video and, and with the audio, there can be a lot of crosstalk that gets confusing and feedback and that sort of thing. So we're just asking people to, to stay uh, muted. Um, I'll explain how we'll handle questions and answers in a moment. Um, let me scroll down here. So in case you don't know who we are, uh, the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance is a member organization. And we're supported by a number of other organizations who uh, contribute to our efforts. And you can see those listed here, our founding current members and also our strategic partners. And um, we're really focused on uh, being a forum and advocate for sustainable use, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. Um, if you want to support our work, uh, we certainly encourage you to reach out to us to join as members. Um, this webinar series and other activities that we do, including the uh, task force that we're going to be discussing today uh, and its work, are all supported by those, those, um, those contributions. Um, some of what we do, we, we facilitate networking. Uh, we do an annual conference. I'll, I'll do a slide, quick slide about in a moment uh, called the Phosphorus Forum. We do these webinars. Uh, we have various other outreach mechanisms. Um, and we orchestrate working groups uh, around phosphorus sustainability issues. Um, we provide technical inputs to other organizations and we represent uh, North America, uh, the phosphorus community both here and abroad. Uh, and finally, if you're um, a company or other organization that seeks to establish itself as the vanguard of phosphorus sustainability, you can join us and um, be branded as such. Um, we also provide a number of community resources, and uh, that includes uh, videos, including this webinar. So this webinar is going to be on our YouTube channel, along with all of our other webinars, which you can find, um, along with video of our uh, various events. And we're also launching a series called Phosphorus Science Now, where we're going to be reviewing abstracts or reviewing um, journal articles with the scientists who wrote them uh, around phosphorus sustainability. Um, and the last introductory slide here, um, I want to invite you all to come to our Phosphorus Forum, which is going to be on April 5th in Washington, D.C. Um, you can come to our website to the events tab and find information about how to register for that. Uh, we, this is our third one. It's going to be right by the White House. It should be great. Uh, we're going to have some programming around the, the uh, information we're talking about today. Um, and also Professor Bruce Rittman, who was the co-recipient this year of the Stockholm Water Prize will be our keynote speaker. Uh, so it should be a great event and I hope you can make it out. Okay, um, there's one slide missing, which is the slide that tells us how to uh, run the webinar. But <laughs> I'll just tell you now in case, uh, I'll try to, do, try to do this from memory. Um, you should see at the bottom of your, your screen uh, for Zoom, um, there should be a couple of icons one for mute, one for start video, and that's uh, those have obvious functions. Again, we'd like to ask everyone to stay muted and, and off video. Um, there's also a, um, a button there for chat, and if you need to um, send us a chat, please do. Um, they um, the thing is is you want to make sure that you um, uh, you want to make sure that you um, um, select the person you want to send the chat to. So in other words, uh, in the chat field, write my name or select my name, with it, which is Matthew Schultz. Um, otherwise, you may end up sending your chat to the entire group, which could be embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but if it's not, uh, that's fine too. You can send it up to the whole group. But um, the way we handle questions during the presentation is uh, you just send them to me by chat. Um, I log them. And then when we get to the questions and answers uh, section at the end, 
I'll post those chats onto the PowerPoint. I'll just copy and paste them directly into the PowerPoint. And um, you'll uh, be able to, um, <clears throat> I'll see the question and then um, the presenters can, can answer that. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, and the last thing is if for some reason this all collapses and uh, Zoom shuts down, at least on your end, um, just go ahead and hit the link again to log back in. It's likely just a, a problem on your computer versus all of our computers. <clears throat> if you still can't lo log in after that, I'll send an email out explaining what happened. Um, but with that, I think I can go ahead and start <clears throat> with introducing uh, today's topic. So <clears throat> um, the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance wants to encourage nutrient recycling in the food system. And uh, recycling, of course, uh, implies recovery of phosphorus. And that recovery lessens the chance of unintended flows of phosphorus from farmland to waterways um, where pollution might occur. Um, we also envision a circular economy for nutrients where we make the most of limited natural resources. Um, of course, we already do a lot of nutrient recycling. Nutrients are recycled when farmers and others apply biosolids and manure to the land. Um, and while from one perspective these materials are deemed waste, they happen to also be full of nutrients like nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, potassium, and other elements of agronomic import. Um, if not properly treated and managed, they can be sources of pathogens, odors, pollutants, um, and that includes excess phosphorus uh, pollution. Um, and while they're nutrient rich, they're often not very well balanced in terms of their uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, for example. And so while applying for to fertilize crops for nitrogen, uh, you may actually over apply um, phosphorus. Um, <clears throat> recognizing these, these potential drawbacks, the US federal and state governments have enacted a series of regulations that affect all manner of land application practice, including what can be applied, when it can be applied, where it can be applied, how much it needs to be treated before it's applied and, and then how it can be applied. Um, unfortunately, these regulatory efforts tend to be fairly poorly coordinated among the states, especially with respect to manure. And um, as a result, a patchwork of regulations has evolved. Um, and owing to this, we, we see challenges to nutrient recycling, um, especially for the growing number of companies who are developing products made from biosolids and manure for sale um, across state lines. Uh, we also wonder uh, whether the regulatory diversity is a product of careful tailoring regulations, carefully tailoring regulations uh, to local context, or if it reflects varying levels of fluency with the science on the part of regulators. So as a first step to getting our heads around all this complexity and how it might affect the sustainable reuse of um, these resources, uh, we've been compiling um, the relevant state and federal regulations around land application to a set of compendia. Uh, and these are now under quality assurance review. Um, we're gonna make these available to the public, uh, both as documents and within an online ArcGIS tool. Um, and this webinar is really an introduction to that ongoing work. Um, it's a little different uh, for a webinar for us. We, we tend to be more instructional with our webinars and have experts talk about a specific topic. Um, we're actually here to um, try to solicit some uh, input and show you, sort of show the community where we're headed with this effort. Um, so your feedback is certainly welcome both uh, during the call and after. Um, ultimately, we wanna bring all these tools together uh, with other tools that are out there to create sort of a one-stop shop for policy analysis and scenario development around land application practices and how they affect water quality uh, and specifically phosphorus pollution. Um, so this regulatory analysis is really just the first step of a larger, a larger project. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, so Dr. Rebecca Munich um, is uh, an environmental engineer with expertise in environmental modeling, uh, especially in evaluating the impact of land management decisions on nutrient inputs into the environment. Uh, she completed a postdoc at University of Michigan, where she focused on finding win-win solutions to address excess phosphorus inputs into Lake Erie. Uh, and she's currently an assistant professor at Arizona State University's School of Sustainable Engineering and Built Environment, and serves as a research scientist with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Uh, she holds a BS in Biological Engineering from University of Arkansas, and MS and PhD degrees in Agricultural and Biological Engineering 
from Purdue. And so, uh, Becca, I'll go ahead and uh, turn this over to you. Okay, can I get a mic check that you can hear me, Matt? I can hear you. Great, so now I'm gonna attempt to share my uh, PowerPoint, so hopefully this will work. And can you see my uh, PowerPoint, uh, just the slide? Um, I'm actually looking right now at your whole presenter view. So okay, <laughs> I thought that might happen. <laughs> Let me try it again. Which if you, that that's fine if that's all you can get, but. I think we can do it uh, in a different way to share it. Um, let's try this. Now, do you see just the slide? That's better. Now I see just the slide. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So thanks, Matt, for the introduction and for uh, allowing me to kind of talk about this project that we've been working on. Um, this slide is basically a summary of what Matt just said um, about I think at the start of the year, we started this project with uh, the Biosolids and Manure Task Force. Where we're really trying to get a handle on what are the state level regulations around land applications of manures from PFOs and biosolids. Um, and we're, we're hoping that this uh, kind of short project, which I'll talk about in a minute, will build into some potentially useful uh, scenario analyses, uh, evaluations, that can then be used by, by others to um, further this circular nutrient economy, as Matt was mentioning. So just a little bit about the project, um, which I've abbreviated Biosolids and Manure Task Force to BMTF up at the top, um, So and the deliverables. So we started out by forming an oversight board, and I think my uh, Matt has a slide on, on those members of the thing here at the end, but we really wanted this tool and the results of this project to be useful and usable. So the very start, we, we formed this oversight board to help us ensure that everything we're developing can be used by uh, different intended audiences. And we've sort of had two main um, stages in terms of deliverables for this project. And what we're sharing right now is kind of wrapping up the first stage of deliverables. Um, so the first part, as Matt mentioned, is we have this sort of white paper slash compendium um, on biosolids and manure regulations at the state level. And then what I'm gonna sort of demo today is a very beta version of an Esri story map, which I'll talk more about what that is in a minute. Um, and then this webinar to kind of talk about the, these two deliverables and get some feedback and more input as we continue to do the QA, QC, which is kind of our next step and to make sure that um, all of the information we pulled from regulatory documents are correct and up to date. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. That's definitely a way if you're really interested in this that you could get involved. And then there's the second stage, which is which will occur after the QAQC, and that's really creating a really enhanced version of this story map that has all of this regula regulatory detail as well as data, and then um, some enhanced data, data layers that I'll talk about that we can pull from the regulations. And then any other related data that might help in thinking about these regulations within the context of different waste streams. Um, we're hoping to de debut this final story map um, at the forum that Matt mentioned at the beginning. That's in April of 2019. Um, so if you're really interested, at, at that point, the, the kind of everything should be public by then, some final reports, and, and the tool will be publicly available. So that's kind of our, our timeline and where we're going. And as I mentioned, I'll kind of start by talking about what we were doing in this first stage. So I just want to talk a little bit about scope here. Um, we're really focused on regulations that impact phosphorus flow specifically directly. So there, are, if you start to look at some of these regulations at the state level, you know, you can get into hundreds of thousands of pages. Um, and there's a lot of things and a lot of regulatory details that are in those that we're not including in our analyses. Um, primarily uh, time permitting uh, being one of the, the things I'll talk about kind of the time frame of this project, but um, we're really just wanted to, to constrain our scope a little on uh, just regulations that impact land application essentially of uh, phosphorus 
from these recycled fertilizer options, biosolids, manures from CAFOs. So kind of as we've, we've progressed through this project, we've gotten feedback from our advisory board on um, regulatory details we want to include, um, the detail uh, of those regulations, um, and some various aspects. And so these are some things that as I present and show you some of these uh, kind of compiled results, if you have feedback, you can think about and you can chat them to Matt or you can um, always send us emails later if you're thinking about them. So a little bit on data collection. We really started um, the actual data collection around February of this year. So we formed the oversight board first and then we found some graduate students who work on this project. So we've really only been working about six months. So again, um, this has been a very short project and that's why we're, we're doing this extra step of getting some QA on our uh, final document so that we can ensure that we have the best information. And I also will caveat, Matt mentioned my degrees and my um, background and experiences in modeling. So regula regulations are not my expertise. So although I recognize certainly the importance of them in uh, controlling and uh, sort of regulating the, the applications of nutrient flows into models and, and things that I work with, um, I'm not an expert. So, you know, we appreciate all these chances to hear feedback from people like you who are experts in, in these fields of regulations, um, especially with respect to states since they do vary significantly. Um, we've had two graduate students uh, work on this project as well as some oversight board members who've been contributing some information and helping us uh, when we run into things that are really confusing and uh, to clarify some of the details. Uh, we've had a couple of consultation meetings with the Project Advisory Board, as I mentioned, that have really helped to shape uh, the data that we're pulling and, and at what level of detail. Um, and what we ended up doing after reviewing a few is creating uh, these data collection templates for biosolids and manures. And they're slightly different because as you'll see, if you start to read through some of our compendium and maybe by the end of today, you'll kind of understand that that they're pretty different in terms of regulations, so they have some similar features. So we tried to keep them, uh, the templates between biosolids and manures as similar as possible, but uh, they are slightly different, and I'll go through um, those templates in a minute. And then finally, we've recently brought on a new graduate student to, to start working on the development of the story map. So um, what I'll show you today is, is only a few weeks work and certainly a very beta version that we're hoping to improve over time. So I'll start by just kind of doing a little overview of each of the compendium. And as Matt mentioned, these are in draft form um, and we're doing QAQC, but eventually they'll be publicly available. So the biosolids is 120 pages, uh, just to give you kind of a an idea of the extensiveness, uh, I guess, of the regula regulatory kind of framework related to biosolids. And keep in mind, this is just information that we pulled related to land applications. So there are a lot of other regulations that are not included here. Um, and what the Compendium for Biosolids does is give a general overview of the federal regulations in the beginning. Um, and then it has for each state that data template that I talked about, uh, which provides more details at the state level. And just as an information purpose, if you're wanting to learn more about the federal codes, it's uh, in 40 CFR part 503. Um, and you can uh, kind of read through that information if you're really interested in it. So the way the Biosolids Compendium is organized, I pulled this data, which is uh, the template uh, data collection form for the US uh, federal regulations. And the first kind of category that it has in it is the regulator. So at the federal level, that's US the EPA. And then what we do is provide links to those regulations. So if you wanna read them in detail yourself, you can uh, do that with these links. And then uh, we have a, uh, uh, some details on whether or not the state is delegated for biosolids, obviously for the federal, that's, that's not applicable. And then any other details that we felt were important to discuss in terms of, of who is regulating um, the biosolids. 
And you'll see a similar section and uh, for the CAFO documents in a minute. In a minute. Uh, the next kind of section that we have are definitions that are important for understanding the regulation. So how biosolids are defined, because that can vary um, from the federal to state and between state levels. Um, biosolid classes is also something that you'll see vary. And then any other definitions that we felt might be helpful for understanding the regulations, uh, because maybe they use a different definition of agronomic rates. Um, when they're discussing their regulations. Uh, the next set uh, are really some of the, the details that we, we feel really impact phosphorus flows. And so you'll see a lot of detail in these, um, especially depending on the state. Uh, the first is setbacks. So there are federal level setback rules for how far away you can apply biosolids from certain waterways. Um, and some states do take those setbacks further. Uh, there are also some weather and seasonal related restrictions. So of when you can apply, for instance, to floated, flooded, frozen, or snow covered ground. Um, and again, some states go beyond this. Um, with respect to, uh, we call it, have a category called agronomic land regula regulations. Um, these are, are just some general um, kind of land management in a way, uh, restrictions to how and when um, you can apply uh, biosolids, it may be nutrient limits as well. So these kinds of things really affect phosphorus flow. So they're kind of all in this broad category. Um, there's a lot of detail on composition testing. So how often uh, manure or sorry, biosolids need to be tested and, and for what? And these also can vary at the state level. Additionally, there may be time restrictions specifically for uh, between when biosolids are applied and when crops may be harvested, and it might vary by crop. Um, there are other uh, vector-based regulations, again, that, that may or may not vary at the state level as well. Um, pollutant regulations as well, um, and you can see this level of detail that, that is on screen is just for the, the federal level, um, which all states have to comply with. And then within each state, there are, uh, there are or may be more restrictions. Some states may adopt the CFR um, exactly. And then the kind of last set of, of details that we were collecting were on transportation. So uh, whether or not there are, are any regulations limiting or allowing the, um, the transport of biosolids um, maybe to different parties and if that affects uh, phosphorus flows and we, we tried to capture that. Whether or not uh, nutrient management plans are required. So uh, at the federal level for biosolids, they aren't, but some states do require it. Um, so that can definitely matter for nutrient flows. Uh, whether or not incineration is allowed is something we're, we're capturing. It certainly varies by state. And then again, there's this kind of other category that um, if anything didn't fit into uh, any of the above regulations, but we felt was potentially important for the flow of phosphorus, we included it there. So that's kind of a very, uh, very brief uh, and quick overview of the compendium for biosolids and kind of what we are collecting. And again, we have all of these details, not just for the federal level, but for each state individually. Uh, the manure compendium is a little bit longer. So as opposed to 120 pages, it's 253 pages. And I'd say that's probably because there, there's a little more uh, variation at the state level compared to the federal level in terms of uh, CAFOs and the subsequent regulation of manure applications from CAFOs. Um, hey, back so, up. I'm going I'm oh, to give you just a quick second to breathe. Um, also, I just mm -hmm. wanted to um, uh, remind people that if they have any questions, to please uh, send them over to chat, um, and I'll, I'll log those for the Q&A at the end. Um, thanks. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I'll try to remember to breathe. Um, so for the manure compendium, it's it's pretty similar in terms of the, the information we are collecting, but with some slight variations uh, compared with biosolids. Again, it's, it's a little bit longer. It has that overview of the relevant federal regulations. 
and then uh, details again captured for each state. I just wanna give just a, kind of some general information in terms of what I'm talking about when I say AFOs or CAFOs, because um, if you come from the biosolids world, you might um, not be as familiar with these definitions. And from the EPA, an animal feeding operation is uh, where animals are kept in confinement for a certain uh, number of days within any 12 month period and where that operation doesn't have crops, vegetation, et cetera, um, sustained during normal growing season. Um, and then to be classified as a large CAFO, which under the CFR is something that, uh, an operation that's regulated, uh, there are certain animal type thresholds. So if you have an, an, a certain number of dairy cattle, you're considered a large CAFO and subject to these federal regulations. So I just wanna mention that before uh, I start using the term CAFO a lot more. Um, and then the relevant federal codes are listed here. There's a few more uh, than biosolids, which is just in 503. Um, so if you wanna go through these in detail, uh, you can search for these specific codes. Uh, so what we'll see here is some similarities between what we are collecting for biosolids and for CAFO manure applications. Um, I'm presenting them in terms of the U.S. regulations here, um, just so you can kind of get a feel for the data we're collecting. Again, U.S. EPA is obviously the regulator at the federal level, and then there's the links to those specific uh, federal codes that are regulating CAFO manure applications. And again, if there was any other pertinent information there, we incorporated it in this kind of other category. Uh, the definition section, so we had a definition for biosolids. We have different kind of section of definitions for um, manure or CAFOs. So uh, just exactly how they define AFOs versus CAFOs versus large or medium or other size uh, feeding operations, those things we tried to capture for each state. Um, while the federal level doesn't use animal units to uh, define CAFOs anymore, it used to, some of the states still use animal units, so animal units are a way to make different animal types equivalent, so sometimes you'll see animal units in terms of defining how, what, what is considered a large CAFO, so if a state does use animal units, we have that information here. Um, then we have this whole section on uh, how NPDES permitting works within a state. So is it, uh, is it the state responsible for NPDES permits? Do they have additional permits um, than NPDES permits for CAFOs? Um, and I won't get into too much detail, but in a minute I'll talk about um, how states may vary with this respect to the federal level in terms of which CAFOs are regulated. Um, and then any other definitions that, again, that we felt were helpful in understanding the subsequent regulations we included here. For the regulatory details, you'll see some very similar categories to biosolids. As I mentioned, we, we wanted to be able to maybe eventually compare and at least keep things consistent between the two as much as we could. Um, so the first section you'll see very similar to biosolids are setback requirements. So again, there are some federal level setback requirements that have to be adhered to in terms of manure applications um, from waterways. Um, similarly, uh, the line is sort of missing, but timing, weather, seasonal kind of restrictions. Uh, there are none specific at the federal level outside of some, there are some broad details within the nutrient management plan guidelines. Um, but some states, as uh, you'll see if you read through the compendium, have sp very specific restrictions on when um, and, and kind of with respect to weather, frozen um, ground, or maybe an imminent rainfall. Uh, they have some restrictions related to those conditions where you can't apply manure unless maybe you have some specific practices or maybe not at all. Um, there are some regulations related to transfer of manure offsite. A lot of these at the federal level tend to be, and at the state level tend to be just a matter of keeping track of uh, records and make sure, making sure you're providing information about the manure you're transferring. 
um, and maybe keeping records about the, uh, the, the lands that it's being applied to. Um, some states may go beyond this and require uh, anyone applying manure from CAFOs, even if it's transferred, um, to, to undergo some other regulations. So that can be some, a slight variation. Um, in terms of nutrient and manure management plans, they are required at the federal level uh, as compared to biosolids, which aren't. Um, and there are a lot of uh, details in terms of what needs to be in the nutrient management plan, though some of those details um, can, and sort of the implementation of those details can be varied by state, uh, but it is required at the federal level for CAFOs. Um, why didn't that change? Okay. Oh, it did. It just had a, sorry, I, I included on the right side. So, um, the application rates is kind of similar to the agronomic uh, category in biosolids. Um, so, at the federal level, there's some uh, details about how uh, CAFOs who are applying manure should be calculating appropriate application rates. Um, and within the states, you'll see a, a wide variety of how uh, these federal rules are applied. So um, maybe they use some state level uh, details like phosphorus indices to uh, kind of help guide those applications. And then similarly, there are composition testing requirements for manure as well as soil. Um, and some states will provide in their regulations even more detail. Um, maybe they want other things to be tested as well. So you will see some state level variation in, in the composition testing. And then we have, again, some extra categories if there are any other regulations that are specific to land application or pertinent um, to this overall conversation, then we include those at the end. Okay, so now I wanna just briefly highlight some of the general findings for both biosolids and manure. So as I mentioned, um, the federal definition uh, for CAFOs, any large CAFO is required to have an MPDS permit. However, due to some variation in state interpretations, um, because of the, uh, there are some litigation after the 2012 federal rule, um, some states interpret this a little bit differently and therefore not all states require that all large CAFOs have an MPDES permit. They may have other permits or they may um, just not consider that uh, an active discharger and not be subject to regulation. So um, this is a little bit tricky and we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to display this in, in data terms, but that's something to consider um, in terms of you know, who these regulations might apply to. Uh, with respect to weather, seasonal timing restrictions, I pulled some of this data from uh, what we've initially done, and about 28 states have uh, snow-covered or frozen ground application restrictions. Um, about 18 have a rain-related application restriction, and this, again, is typically if there is forecasted precipitation of some amount within some, some future amount of time, then they're not allowed to apply. There are even some states that have slope-specific application restrictions, so slopes above a certain amount cannot receive uh, land applications of manures from CAFOs. And then there were a few states that had some time of day application restrictions, so some that I saw where they you can't apply manure at night. Um, so there are a lot of variations within this category, but trying to kind of uh, culminate these into to some things that might help us understand how these vary across the state levels. Um, with respect to nutrient limits, some states have very specific um, restrictions in terms of calculating N and P rates. Some states may really focus on N versus P, um, so that can definitely vary. And then with respect to compositions testing, they, they tended to follow federal regulations pretty similarly, but some states would add additional uh, parameters that need to be tested within both the uh, manure itself as well as maybe the soil. Um, so that can definitely vary by state. With respect to biosolids, some similar um, kind of summer, summa, summation of the results. 
about a quarter of all of the states required nutrient management plans. So even though the federal level didn't require it, um, there were quite a few states who, who went ahead and required a nutrient management plan for biosolids land application. Um, and then Matt pulled these stats for me, about eight of 10 states uh, in the Mississippi do not, and about six of eight states that border the Great Lakes also do not require the nutrient management plans. Um, about a third of all states have phosphorus-based restrictions for biosolids applications, and uh, most of these are east of the Mississippi. Uh, about half of the regulations at the state level were more restrictive than the federal levels with respect to, to setback distances, those weather-related or seasonal application restrictions, um, the agronomic practice restrictions, as well as the types or amounts of the contaminants. In, in the biosolids. Um, and just kind of a, a general anecdote that the restrictions uh, for agronomic practice um, were the most common deviation from federal. Uh, and then the path pathogen and vector regulations didn't vary as much among the states that the federal regulations were pretty much adopted as is. And this caveat can certainly apply to both manures and biosolids that uh, states often reserve the right to regulate uh, on a case-by-case -case basis um, as needed. And there's also certainly a lot of uh, states that have emergency options for applications of manures as well. So this is just kind of one attempt of ours to kind of summarize our kind of general findings from our first review. But as you can imagine, um, Going through what is almost 400 pages of regulatory details and trying to synthesize that uh, is not easy. So what we really wanted to do is try to figure out a way that we can take these very large compendium and transform them into something that could be informative to stakeholders. Um, it could be used to compare data across states. And so one of the ways we want to do this is through the story map, map, but kind of how do we get from this very large uh, and sort of cumbersome document into something that's maybe a map. So I just want to show these as kind of our first approach, and then I'll talk a little about kind of our second phase approach. So in our first approach, <clears throat> I wouldn't pay attention to anything in, in huge detail here. What I'll say is the green rows are details that are exactly from the compendia. And then what we tried to do was say, are there some questions that we could answer about these specific categories in green? And that's those questions in the orange. So this one is for biosolids. So are there other regulations for setbacks more stringent for a given state with respect to the federal regulations? And so we can answer that with a yes or no. Um, and so, this was kind of our first pass at trying to take the information that's in a Word document form and put it into something that we can compare more easily. Um, similarly, for the manure and CAFO manure applications, we tried to see what are some questions we can answer and then map from this larger sort of cumbersome document. So you'll see, uh, are there restrictions of land application for specific things. So with respect to saturated soils, can are there restrictions uh, for applying in floodplains or if there's future rainfall? So these are some of the things and kind of trying to take this very large document and put it into something that is useful and usable, we tried to do was, is try and answer some questions with uh, this data in the documents. And so these kind of information are incorporated into our first beta version of the tool. Um, which I'll demo here in a minute. Um, so I want to just quickly talk about uh, the development of a story map. If you haven't played around with story maps online, there are probably thousands of them now if you Google Esri story maps. And they're a really unique way to be able to share geospatial data or other kinds of data through storytelling online and publicly so that anyone can take a look and interact with the data. Um, again, we really wanted something that was more interactive and also could be adaptive than a static report. So as regulations change, maybe we want to change the, the uh, compendium is kind of hard, but it's pretty easy to update some data layers. So we really wanted something that can 
evolve and also be useful and interactive for people who want to explore the data themselves. The other nice thing that we can do by putting all of this information into a story map is that we can overlay it with other related data that can help think beyond just the regulations. And I'll demo that in a minute as well. So I will go ahead and demo that right now and I'll attempt to switch to uh, my browser to show you the beta tool. Yeah, while so, you're doing that, Becca, I'll just sure. remind everyone to please uh, go ahead and send us chats if you have any questions. Um, the chat button should be <coughs> at, in the ribbon for Zoom and in your Zoom web window, and just make sure to select me as the person you send the chat to, and um, I'll log those and um, can, uh, we can discuss them later. We don't have any chats right now, so um, if you have questions, it'd be, uh, you're likely to have them answered right now, so please, please do. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we'll do our best to answer them right now. So, uh, Matt, you, can you see my um, my project overview story map? Yes, I see the, the home screen. Okay, great. So this is an example of what our landing page could look like, though I will say we've only been working on this for a few weeks, so it will certainly evolve into something that's a little more user-friendly and uh, be able to really tell a story, but I really wanted to give you an idea of what we can do and show uh, by taking this information that's in this long document and putting it into something online that you can interact with. And because uh, to, to kind of avoid potential complications, I'm instead of clicking through uh, the maps, I've pulled things up in different browsers, so it'll be a little bit faster to demo this. But essentially, what you would start out by coming to our landing page, which would give an overview of our project. And here we might include some specific maps that we think are really important for this project. But then you could go in and start exploring uh, with respect to manure regulations and with respect to biosolids regulations. So uh, if you were to go into one of our maps, it would look something like this. And you can see my map, right? Okay, great. Um, where we've taken some of those questions I, that, I, that I showed you before, where we were asking questions of the data contained in the documents, and we can answer them and then map those answers. For example, this is looking at the CAFO manure regulations. Uh, this is a very simple one is, you know, who is the regula regulatory agency in each state that's responsible for implementing regulations for uh, CAFO manure applications. So you can see the variation across the state for this. I thought it was just an easy one to, to practice on. Um, and the categories are over on the left side of the screen. So some, some have a combination. Some are the environmental sort of EPA equivalent. Some are natural resources. Some are agricultural agencies. Um, but this sort of gives you an idea of how we can take some data that's in the document and transform it into something that you can compare across states. So I'll show um, a couple other examples for the, the manure as well. This, this is an example of those frozen ground restrictions. So whether or not the states have uh, an additional uh, restriction for manure applications based on if there's frozen ground. And what makes sense is most of the northern states do. Um, so that's in green and the red is, uh, is the states that don't. And, um, Purple is other, so one thing I'll mention is that there are some states like California that regulate beyond the state level, so those can vary even within the state, uh, if you're wondering why California is purple. Um, and I'll also take the time here to mention again that these are all preliminary results and will be QA'd um, by experts uh, within regions and states who really work um, specifically with these regulations. And then one last kind of example from the manure. Uh, this is how states allow or regulate the P application rates. So is it through a phosphorus index that the state uses, or some states may only require that soil tests be done, um, and then some states might say you can use either, and some states may not have any information on this. So this is kind of one way to see that. And then one thing I want to show, and hopefully you can see this when I click on it, um, if you go in and you want to explore a state in detail specifically, you can click on the state. And what this does is provide you with all of the information from the documents. 
as well as the kind of answers to some of those questions. So um, basically, with this kind of pop-up, you can explore those documents uh, for a given state as you go through. And I'll just quickly also show, here's, here's a, an example of data for biosolids. And I just wanted to zoom out a little bit to show that we did collect data on Alaska and Hawaii, even though I had zoomed in to the continental US. And this is um, whether or not they require nutrient management plans. And this coloring scheme is backwards, where the green is no and the red is yes, but gives you an idea of the information that we can kind of display more easily. And then I wanted to start doing, showing some of the, the uh, enhanced capacity a little bit. So with the tool, you can zoom into certain regions or states if you're really interested in looking across a region, say the Southwest region I'm showing here, and you wanna compare uh, different restrictions um, or different regulations across those states, you can start to zoom in. And then what is uh, really cool and what we're moving towards and sort of our, our final version is incorporating other data that might be useful in terms of understanding uh, the regulatory data. So what I've done here is I've, sh I've zoomed in on Arizona because that's where I'm sitting today. And I've also shown where wastewater treatment facilities are. So these are sources of biosolids. So you can kind of get an idea of that. And then it's a little harder to see, but the gray outlines are counties within Arizona, and then the numbers within each county show the number of uh, permitted, or these are number of CAFOs per county. So the kind of really cool thing about this tool is we can begin to overlay other related information uh, to show how these regulatory frameworks are situated with respect to um, related information. So you can really explore in detail um, these regulations and, and kind of this space of, of circular nutrient economy. So that's all I wanted to show today because, uh, again, this tool is in beta form um, and we will be getting uh, QAQC done soon and this will be a more enhanced and more interactive as we go. Um, so now I wanna switch back, um, hopefully fluid, more fluid-like to the presentation again. Um, good. All right, you seen my, my screen? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have some ongoing work. So that kind of wraps up the kind of first stage of the project that I mentioned where we're really compiling all this data and trying to get it into some sort of form that is helpful for decision makers um, who want to really think more about these regulations and how they affect nutrient flows. So we've started uh, the beginning of QAQCing all of this data. As I mentioned, we're not experts in, in regulatory details and especially not how they vary between each state. So we're definitely looking um, to people who can, who are those experts to, to give us feedback um, on the quality of, of the details we've extracted and making sure that they're correct. Um, we do have lists and we have identified people in each state for this, but if, if you feel you're an expert and would like to participate, you can let Matt or I know. Um, an additional thing we're doing is some uh, working with researchers at the University of Laval in Quebec, and they are also compiling this information for Canadian provinces. Um, it's a little more difficult than we thought because it's certainly a different regulatory environment, so we're trying to make them a little more seamless in terms of the information we're extracting. Um, and then it's really a focus on uh, phase two of our story map. So going from this sort of basic data that I've showed you and that we're collecting to something that's a lot more interactive and detailed. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing, um, rather than just asking sort of questions of the data, we want to see what kind of data we can pull from that um, those compendia and create sort of a geospatial layer based on it. So one example is uh, the setbacks that are required at both federal and state levels. So um, we have quantitative data on how far away they can be from certain things like water bodies. And so what we're planning to do is for that, for example, is to 
create a geospatial layer that shows uh, where manure and biosolids can be applied with respect to these regulations, and then also kind of overlay how that might vary within each state. Is it, you know, does it get more restrictive um, and in what way? So while we can do what we've been doing, which is sort of asking questions of the data and answering those questions, we can also pull some of this more quantitative uh, spatial data to really enhance our understanding of these regulatory limitations um, and constraints in terms of biosolids and manure applications. So that's something we're working on for this phase two of the story map. And then we're also planning, I showed you the wastewater treatment plants and CAFOs per county. Um, we're planning to add a lot more of that data. And certainly if you have some ideas of specific data sets you think would be great on there, um, we're we have to make sure that we have the permission to, to put these online, but um, we're certainly uh, open to any ideas you might have there. Um, we've certainly got a, a big list of, of our own, but um, if you've got some ideas, we'd love to hear that. And then finally, some of the final deliverables from this project uh, are putting our major findings um, from both the compendium and as we start to do this enhanced data extraction into a publication and then presenting both our, our kind of major findings and our enhanced tool at the forum in April. And I think that's all of my slides, so I'll turn it back over to you, Matt, to finish up. Great, Becca. Thanks for that overview. And um, as uh, are you seeing my slide now too? <clears throat> yeah, but not in the presentation mode. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Go ahead and put that up. Um, so yeah, I, Becca mentioned we had a lot of uh, reviewers involved in the. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little <clears throat> coffee. Um, in the. Um, uh, in the process from our oversight board, we have we had a number of people, and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, people who participated in uh, in those calls and helping to review that work. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, we do have some time for questions and answers. I um, generally what we do is we just post the questions on our our uh, page here and uh, ask them to the presenter. What I'm going to do actually, since we only had one question. Um, come through the chat. I'll go ahead and put that up here. Oops. Uh, I have to get out of presenter mode to do this. Um, so, <laughs> and the question was, can we have access to the story map on the Alliance platform? Um, and so, yes, eventually you will have access on the, on the platform. Um, the tool, uh, the real release date for the tool is going to be, uh, we're targeting the phosphorus form on April 5th. Um, we'll have a link to the tool for sure on, on the Alliance website. Um, Becca, maybe you could speak a little more to uh, the QAQC on the tool end of things. I know I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little less clear on sort of how that's going to work exactly, but I know there are um, there's ways for people to do that um, who've been identified as experts. Yeah, so you're asking whether or not the people QAQC can have access to the tool? Yeah, correct. Um, I think we could. Uh, it, yeah, I think we can. I don't think, I don't know if we were planning on doing that, but if people reviewing um, feel like that would be helpful, we can we can probably figure out a way to, to do that um, in terms of sharing permissions. Okay, great. Um, that's the only uh, chat question we had come in, but um, I'll, since you know we have time, if people want to ask questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourselves um, <clears throat> and ask a question. I'll give Matt, a, I see uh, one more question. Oh, you do. Up there. I, I'm. Um, it's sort of related. It, it and I don't know if <clears throat> you can copy it. It says, "Will the story map be publicly available or just?" to Phosphorus Alliance members, and I'm pretty sure, but you can confirm, Matt, that this will be publicly available, the final story map. Yes, the story map will be publicly available, that's correct. Um, okay, so um, if anyone else has a question, feel free to send it by chat. I'll also just um, hang out here silently for uh, an awkward amount of time to allow people to pipe in if they want to uh, unmute themselves in, in, in chat. 
Otherwise, we'll just close out after this. So feel free to pipe up. Okay, no questions? Going once, going twice. Looks like we have a new message, hold on. Wait, yeah, I'm okay. if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put these up on the screen so we know what we're talking about. Um, okay. <clears throat> Why do you call it phosphorus platform? Uh, this deals with all nutrients. <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, uh, it does, this project does, where the organization is called the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Um, and we uh, focus on phosphorus for a lot of reasons, some historical, some technical. Um, but uh, you're correct that this particular project will take into account, you know, anything that's land applied. So just not just be phosphorus, but it'd be uh, nitrogen and, and other things as well would be swept up in the regulations. Our focus, though, generally is on phosphorus. And so um, that <clears throat> is certainly the bias in the report. Um, <clears throat> Another question that's come in. Are you distinguishing between class A and class B biosolids? Yes, uh, that's uh, definitely a big focus of the biosolids regulations and a big source of the variation in the regulations. I would also add uh, class EQ um, uh, in, in, into that mix. And in some states actually there are other designations like class AA, or I think Iowa has an even weirder system like a type one, type two, type three, or something like that. <clears throat> um, so those are all taken into account and uh, they're, all, um, they're all in the compendium. So yes, we do we do, do that. Um, another question has come in, which is, uh, is this presentation going to be available to participants? Yes. Um, so uh, if you go to the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance YouTube channel, I would say in a next week, say Monday, um, we'll have the um, whole presentation recording up there and available for you to watch. Um, and also it's a good place if people want to uh, further discussion <clears throat> on this topic, you can of course comment on videos on YouTube and we have uh, that feature enabled so people can have further discussion about what, what we've talked about today. Um, so um, just go to YouTube and uh, if you search Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, you'll find our various, uh, our various channels. <clears throat> and so um, here comes another one. Do you cooperate with nutrients to come up with solutions? Uh, no, um, we um, have had them um, present at our phosphorus forum. So Steve Rowe, who's their CEO, presented at our uh, first phosphorus forum. He gave the keynote there. <coughs> um, and, and they've been at our, and they were represented at our last one, uh, but we don't have any formal cooperative agreement with them. Um, and I think that is all the, uh, we certainly, if, if, the, if the questioner is from Nutrient, we'd certainly welcome Nutrient to uh, be involved. Uh, and uh, we've made that outreach to them before and be happy to, to have them involved in the Alliance. Um, and as well, that goes for everyone else on the call. If, if anyone is interested in becoming a member, please reach out to me um, via our website and we'll uh, be in touch with more information about how to do that. Um, I think that's it for questions, Becca. Um, that's all I see. <clears throat> okay. So I think uh, we can probably close this out. Um, remind everyone again uh, to please come to the Phosphorus Forum if you can on April 5th. Uh, you can find registration information on our website, uh, which is phosphorusalliance.org. Um, thanks, Becca, for presenting this information. Please do, do send us feedback. If you want to send us emails uh, via website with feedback, that's great too. Uh, we'd love to hear, especially from people who are interested in doing scenario development exercises uh, or, or regional planning, um, what data layers would be most uh, helpful for you to be able to layer on top of the regulatory data to sort of make uh, develop, develop scenarios and make more informed choices about uh, the policy decisions. And so 
uh, please do reach out to us if you have any of that information. Uh, and with that, I will close things off and thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Bye.